this Django presentation will be less focused on teaching people how to use Django and more po focused on how much pain I experience learning Django mm -hmm. and helping you avoid that pain. Um, so what will we talk about? We're going to talk about me because I'm important, I suppose. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about what is Django, um, what I wished I knew starting out, and how does Django support AI now that we're talking about LLMs and AI and all that's kind of a hot topic right now. And then at the end, I will provide a QR code where you can find me because of how important I am. <laughs> uh, so a little bit about me. I'm a military veteran, spent about 14 years in the United States Air Force, where I reached Master Sergeant. Uh, I've been a software engineer for about 10 years at both Fortune 500 and startups. Um, at one point, I volunteered as a particle accelerator researcher and technician for about two years, uh, computer engineering bachelors, avionic system associates, and a military intelligence operations associates. And I'm also very interested in permaculture and building software companies. Uh, sometimes those things go, to, go together. Um, I'm currently working as a fractional CTO slash uh, full stack engineer through Rosenblatt AI, which is the consultancy I work at. All right, so I'm going to get into what is Django for those that uh, do not know about it yet. So it follows the model view template uh, architectural pattern, um, which is server heavy client light as opposed to the um, single page application architecture, which is more client heavy. Um, this architecture, the models are what defines your data. The views are how you implement your business logic. And then the template is the kind of client layer. So that's where your HTML type uh, coding is gonna go. Um, templates are a little different in that you code with HTML and then you can replace like uh, attributes inside the HTML with uh, dynamically. So it's got it's not a static website. It can be dynamic as well. Uh, it's open source. It's created in 2003 when the programmers of Lawrence Journal World Newspaper learned Python. Uh, it's also now maintained by the Django Software Foundation. So it's got some pretty serious backing. Um, it's not going to like go away anytime soon. There's a pretty huge um, uh, job market just for knowing Django. Uh, and interestingly, you can get a Django certification on LinkedIn for those interested. Um, there's a, a really good annual uh, Django developer survey that you can also go check out if you're interested in like what the most common tools that are used with Django are, things like Postgres for the database. Um, it, can, it can support a full stack app, or you can use it as a back end for mobile apps. So if you're thinking of uh, working with Flutter or React or any of the other kind of client uh, front ends that need to be able to call a back end, you can use it for that as well. Um, but it also supports, like I mentioned before, the templates support doing a front end, so it can do both. Um, it's stable, secure, fast, supported, and scalable, according to them. Uh, but Instagram has made use of it at scale. So there are some use cases of it actually being uh, pretty capable. So here's a diagram since, you know, text heavy slides are always tough to digest of the uh, model view template um, architecture. So here you have like the user is interacting with the framework and then the URLs are something within Django that helps with routing. Um, and then the view model template Data. So the models are interacting with like your Postgres database. Um, and models specifically are really cool in that you can, in Python, define the data structures. So if you have a user profile, you can do username, uh, their social media, you know, do different things to define a user in Python. And it will re be reflected in your Postgres database. So you're not having to do actual SQL. Um, because it's using Django's ORM. Um, I'm going to go for it. So why is the Django framework in its own box instead of the whole thing? Uh, so that was because I was operating very quickly and grabbed an image. 
Okay. Um, so that box actually houses everything to the right of that box. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. No, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, so to get into what I wish I knew starting out, um, first things first is testing, because test-driven development, all that good stuff. Uh, you can test your data models, your views, and your templates really easily uh, using like the classic Python unit test. Um, but the Django REST framework allows you to simulate a client programmatically, which means you can, in the testing framework, pretend that you have like an app and it's calling your back end. So you can make requests, you can check that it gives like a, a status good 200 response or a 404 if things are supposed to go bad or aren't supposed to go bad. So you can do a lot of like programmatic testing with Django. And that will save a lot of headache if you um, start out with that built. Uh, here's an example of using the request client. Um, describe, kind of in code, it shows what, um, how you do go about that. I'll let everyone take a look for a second. All right, so unit tests. So you assume that this is the correct behavior. <laughs> uh, highly recommend monkeyuser.com because they have some great cartoons. <laughs> All right, dev containers is the next one. Um, if your team using super complicated build tools to set up your dev environment like Bazel, just stop. <laughs> uh, don't do this. Respect your developer's cognitive load. Um, and when your one basil person leaves, then you're, everyone is uh, not going to be able to change anything. So I recommend checking out dev containers if you're starting out in Django as a way to standardize your developer's uh, uh, environment. Similar to how containers already kind of standardize environments for when you're deploying an app, you can do that for your developers as well. Again, complexity. <laughs> Basil versus getting dev containers. Uh, and then another one is being able to generate an API client. So this one was um, an effort I made at a previous startup I worked at that ended up um, not only fixing performance issues, but it ended up also making it a much better developer experience um, because what you can do is you can generate an open API schema and then use that schema to generate clients in different languages. So kind of going back to having like a mobile app, if Django is your backend, you're, you can actually generate an, an actual client for that without having to manually go in and create one yourself. And you could do it in things like Flutter, uh, React, um, just all kinds of like front-end languages are supported. And then uh, another really helpful part of that is using something like a GitHub runner or, or a GitLab runner, I mean, and then GitHub Actions. And so you can actually automate that so that when your developers uh, make changes to a model in the back end, it automatically updates the client that the front-end uh, folks are using. And here's a diagram of, uh, that describes that. So you start out with something like your Django models, uh, which your Django model, again, is that thing that's um, describing your data structure, so your user profile. You know, if, you, if, if on the front end you wanted to be able to update or create a new user or um, delete a user, you would need a client to be able to do that. And once you define it in the model, you can kind of automa automatically go through this chain and. Uh, generate the client that it, to be able to do all of that. And plus, you also can get um, Swagger documentation out of it, which is this. is a very cool um, functionality where you can test APIs out in your browser. And this updates whenever you change the back end. Um, and this is also built off of the open API schema. So you can get both manual testing of your APIs in the back end, and you can generate a client. Um, 
So this is one of those ones that's really going to save a ton of time if you're working with Django. Yeah, and then here, I, here I've shown how you can use uh, GitLab to automate that process for Flutter or React. And then um, Django Shell is another thing that folks might not know about when you're getting into Django, and that one is all about using the Python interpreter uh, to be able to do um, database actions. So you can do database queries. You can add test data to your database if you're in a development environment. Um, I've used Django Shell in the past to connect to a production database. Very dangerous. Uh, don't recommend. <laughs> but uh, there was like an emergency situation that we had to fix. And it allowed me to do that using my terminal. Um, so over here, I have an example of uh, how you would go about using the Django shell. So you just import your the model you want to work with, um, and then you you know create a query, and then um, or in this case they're uh, saving a database item, so they're making a change to the database and saving some data. Uh, Django admin is another really good one that folks might not know about getting into Django, and that is basically a free UI that updates to reflect your database, um, specifically the models. And you're able to, similar to Django Shell, um, whether you're in a dev environment or in a production environment, you can go in and make changes to the data using a really nice user interface. And it automatically updates itself based on your current the current structure of Django. So I can show an example of it here. So here you have things like um, catalog with authors, book instances, books, genres. So those are examples of what might be in your database as data structures. And you can see how if you have someone on your team that's not able to, to go in and do technical stuff with like Django Shell, but still needs to be able to manage the data. Like let's say someone on your app uploaded something that's really sketchy. Uh, an, a non-technical person can come in here and use drop downs and, and click on buttons in order to delete that item out of the database. Or even you can program your own actions as well. So if you need to be able to send emails to all users, you can program that as a custom admin action and be able to select the users and then send those specific users emails. So it gives a lot of power to kind of your marketing folks. Uh, deploying Django. So highly recommend using a Docker container to deploy Django. Um, also, the, if you're using AWS, I recommend using Fargate to start out um, because it's more generalized and once you learn what your limits are going to be so like if your limit is the amount of data you're storing or something like that you can figure out if you need to go to EC2 later but it's it's generally recommended to start with Fargate. Um, an interesting or important thing to consider when you're getting into Django as well is whether you want to be synchronous only or if you need asynchronous capabilities so if you're building um, like a messaging app where you need to have that asynchronous real-time communication, you'll want to use an ASGI ser server versus uh, WSGI, which is only synchronous. And synchronous means like REST APIs. And then also white noise is a recommended add-on for the static files. What is that? Uh, so white noise helps you serve things like the static images on your website um, and static files in general. And you can use it as a kind of, it takes some of the coding that you would have to do otherwise out of the equation. Okay. And you can also use it to interface with something like AWS CloudFront um, in order to be able to use like cloud, uh, like a content delivery network or a CDN. And it, so it helps you interface on that level as well. Does it assign those static values to URLs and manage value for them? Uh, yeah. So, oh, sweet. 
Yeah, oh, so it's... Oh, a pain, pain point in Django. <laughs> oh, okay. Definitely. <laughs> when, did you, when, did, when, when did that come out, just out of curiosity? Oh, you know? gosh. Um, it definitely came out before I started working with Django, which was only about two years ago. So okay. it's, it's had some time to mature, I think. And they list uh, white noise on their official Django documentation. Yeah, so well, I, that, that was a sticking point for me when I was looking at Django. I was like, not only is it a pig, how do I get those? <laughs> get my... uh, Definitely. Huh? Definitely. No. All right. So this is kind of what it would look like if you were running it in the cloud in a Docker container. Uh, this is the super simplified diagram, um, but basic. Most often, people use Postgres, Redis, uh, Nginx, um, and then, like I mentioned, the WSGI or ASGI servers. Um, and then you'll you might have like a load balancer in front of Django to help in case the uh, the incoming traffic got to you know to a certain point. And um, I, also to add on to the WSGI versus ASGI. Uh, WSGI is Python's official uh, server for doing this kind of thing. And then ASGI, uh, now, which has both the synchronous and asynchronous capabilities, is um, the successor to it. So you can't really go wrong if you go with ASGI. The only reason that they still use the uh, WSGI is it's simpler to set up. It's a little easier to work with. You're not having to deal with the additional async things. All right, and since I'm mentioning synchronous versus async, I figured I would go into that a little bit. So ASGI um, supports something called Django channels, and Django channels are what you will use if you want to do web sockets, chat protocols, or like Internet of Things. Um, and then, like I mentioned, ASGI is the successor to WSGI. So this is one of those things you'll want to be aware of if you're starting out with your app for the first time and, and don't want to have to come back and refactor a, like a core architecture thing. And then finally, how can we use Django with AI? Um, my recommendation has been to make use of something called Celery. And it works well with Django um, to handle AI workflows because what it does is it's a, a queue. So you can hand off the task to Celery, and that will load like the, you know, an item into the queue. And you can keep doing that as, you, as tasks come in. And it frees up the Django server to continue handling requests while the, while the seller, uh, Celery queue continues to churn through like AI inference. So you can also do things like schedule tasks and other things like that, um, or have more of a distributed architecture, um, so, which will help with things like scalability of the Django app. Uh, and it also runs asynchronously, so it's not blocking the uh, primary thread on Django. Uh, and this is an example of AWS with Django and Celery doing like heavy compute tasks. And just to summarize it real quick, um, AWS has its own Thing called AWS Batch, which does like Celery workers. And what Celery will do in this case is instead of you handling the message queue, you'll hand off your messages to SQS. Um, CloudWatch will keep an eye on the messages and say, oh, OK, we've got a whole bunch of messages. So now I need to increase the number of Celery workers that are churning through these messages. And then the, the once batch kind of gets through and the workers have churned through all of the content, then it will kind of scale it back down again and then uh, wait for more messages from Celery. And that Celery application on the far left there, that's your Django and Celery combination. So this is one way you can uh, handle those heavy workloads when you're working with the cloud. It's kind of a dumb question, but like, doesn't mm -hmm. Python handle, doesn't have a built-in functions for handing uh, like generators and promises. Oh yeah, this is kind of um, a way to. It seems like there's more robust management. Manageable, a bigger mode. Yeah. 
so yeah, this is like a way to, um, I suppose it's kind of like a wrapper of that and it has things to be able to make like API calls and has a, like a protocol that it can transfer over the internet. So you get in addition to that, like async capability where you're, yeah. you also get things like being able to send that data to some destination. So it's a, it's a pretty light wrapper, a pretty light tool, okay. but it takes some of the manual coding of having to do that kind of stuff out of the equation. And it sounds like you do like granular rate limiting. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so just to poke fun at, uh, <laughs> at myself and AI in general. I mean, that thing looks cool. <laughs> it, it does. <laughs> it does something. The brain floating in terror. Right? You know. <laughs> All right. There's my, as every, as every presentation in Startup Week needed, there's my QR code and <laughs> um, figured I'd ask if there's any questions. Can I read that one? I'm, I'm happy to send that. <laughs> Definitely. Are you okay with us adding to the recording too? Uh, sure. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Um, I'm wondering what other, uh, so the model view template, actually back up, the model view template framework I didn't like Django. I'll just put it that way. I didn't like Django for a lot of the reasons. It sounds like you also didn't like Django. <laughs> but uh, the control mechanisms mostly happen server side, right? Like that's mm -hmm. sort of the jam. Yeah. It, it takes the logic out to takes the logic out to the view that's supposed to make the front end lighter, right? Yep. I'm wondering what other model B, what model B controllers you've used and worked with, and how you might compare. Pass down to Django, hmm. if, any, if any or not, if any of the other frameworks. Um, so I haven't, I think Django is pretty much the only big MVC I've worked with. Okay. But I know there's some other lightweight tools as well for those interested in Python and doing this kind of stuff, which is uh, like Flask um, and Fast API. So Django is big, it's opinionated as heck. Uh, so you have to do things the Django way. Um, but if you wanna have flexibility, like Fast API is a good one and uh, Flask is another good one. Yeah, Flask, I've heard, heard of Flask in terms of like, mm -hmm. but it's like uh, Django just seems like really, it seemed like it was really good at exactly the things that Django did. Yeah. Right. And, and Nothing else is as good as those things that Django does exactly, but you want to do something else. Yeah, exactly. Like if you try to fight the opinionated nature of Django, it's it's gonna suck. <laughs> so, hundred percent. But it's but within those constraints, these pain points. But everything everything that you covered was like, oh, you had no of that. It's not. <laughs> Man, she has more patience than I do. <laughs> nah, yeah, it, I suppose it depends on how much you want to do manually versus how much you want to do guided. Because I felt like uh, Django was like a guided framework, like, oh, here's how you are going to do business logic. And this is the only way you're going to do it. But we have a, a great toolkit for you to use to do it. So um, if you're okay with that, then it works well. Um, but it's also kind of a lot of black magic. <laughs> so <laughs> um, there's a lot of Django isms that you kind of have to learn, like knowing how to do the routing URLs.py. Um, you can kind of get rid of the templates, and that's what I did. I just went with Flutter for my front end. So you, just, so you threw a front end on top? Yeah. OK. That's. <laughs> um, that seems like a good idea. Yeah. 
Um, if you need dynamism in the front end. Yeah, oh, totally. I've sort of seen both schools with Django and Flask and Fast APIs. Yeah, I, I think um, Django's. Why you, why you might uh, Well, no, just, I've never played around with some templates long enough to know why they're terrible. <laughs> um, they're not necessarily terrible, they're just, they're, uh, uh, they're limited in their dynamism. Yeah. They're, they're, they're much more literally a view. Is that, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like, here's a document, this is the document, that's what the document Yeah, and you're not and you're not doing that with templates. Nothing like that is happening with templates. Yeah, yeah I can see that being great. Yeah, but it's it's but it's cool if that's if if you need it, if you have a new site and that new site is just feeding out mm -hmm. articles that you need to update okay. about any uh, uh, with, with that you're never going to change. Even if you do, it's only going to be in a footer. Yeah, exactly. Over the new ACG dive again before. Oh yeah. Um is there something specific that you're I interested just, in? Just the slides went over quickly and I didn't even go oh. back. I, I was taking notes and I didn't even get a chance to really like yeah. understand. Let's see, did I go I think I went too far. Yeah. Here we go. Um so ASGI is um it's it, Actually, I wonder if I can open link and still have it show up. Oh no. Okay. Oh, you have to you have to share the other tab for cast. Yeah. Uh yes. So. So can you do offline applications in the CGI? Um. So like uh. Yeah, like say there's two that can be offline or inline, and they're both editing the same information. Right. Handle conflict. Uh, so it's I don't I don't think it's about handling like data. Yeah. Specifically, so, yeah. it's um it's things like if you need like a web socket uh, to be able to stream, uh, especially for like chat rooms or messaging or yeah. uh, Internet of Things. Like, yeah, cat that. That's a classic problem. I feel like the being, needing to handle, you know, acid, uh, your database, you know, not having, you're having transactions and things like that. So I think transactions is one of the things that's built into Django as well. Um, whenever you hook Postgres up to it, so what it'll do, it'll it'll reserve a slot in the database, and if another process tries to come in and, and like make changes that transaction will say no or you can also do it where a transaction can roll back a series of changes if one down the road fails so those are two things that you can uh, do it with like Django Is that specifically with Postgres or any sort of I think I've only used Postgres but the way it felt was that Django was abstracting it. So even if you hooked up another uh, like relational database, then it should still work the same. And that was another nice thing about, about Django was that it abstracted something so that you didn't have to worry about a bunch of like manual changes when you change your data model. Because you're writing all the queries and all of your database changes in Python, and then it's translating that 
And then you also get a, um, a history of migrations. So if you did a bunch of changes to the database schema, uh, you'd be able to recreate that history if you needed to. You can also edit the migration and be able to change like database tables manually by just editing a Python file. So there's less having to go, you know, like you, it does a lot to keep you from having to go into um, Postgres and do things there. That's what, that's what I have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I need cool. to do some more reading, but I will do that when I have the slides. Yeah. Yeah, I like. I think it's specifically on some of these. I get what you're saying, which is separate, but like, yeah, mm -hmm. you need to do that as well. Yeah, and Django channels is what you probably want to look into if you're using ASGI. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Django gives you a whole bunch of tools to work with. Uh, Flask is kind of like a blank, like a blank piece of paper. Uh, so you're starting, it, it's super simple, super easy, super fast to get started with Flask. Um, but you might have to bring in a bunch of like third party dependencies depending on like what kind of tools you need. Um, whereas Django comes with a ton of tools that you can make use of. So but the problem with Django is it's a lot to learn and a lot to, a lot of like complexity that you can handle. So two different use cases I think. The two yeah. is actually being used for uh, any data integrations or data movement faster, like without any complexity. Whereas Django is for framework building or like layers building for websites and stuff. Instagram actually is built on Django. Framework. Yeah. So. And and with Django, you also get some options for authentication and stuff too. So if you need to do like different types of authentication, it has built in tools for that. I can probably keep going on. No, Flask forever. is actually replaced by Fast API. Flask, Flask. Fast API is being used to uh, oh, yeah. so I think I so there's the the, the Django documentation is pretty extensive, but there's also a separate um, documentation called the Django REST framework. Uh, the Django REST framework is an add-on on top of Django. So if you're if you're working with like APIs, that's a good thing to go to to like learn about how to set up like a bunch of API related stuff. Um, and then I pretty much just did a whole bunch of YouTube <laughs> and. Uh, did course, you say at the beginning, did you say there's a LinkedIn course? Oh, uh, there's certificate. Or certification. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's some, like if you're getting into Django, there's a little test you can take on LinkedIn to get a badge that says you're good at Django. 